I took this assignment as an opportunity to pick the brains of two people that I find truly inspiring, my mother and my father. My mom might be one of the smartest people I know. She has attended law school, she has been a professor, and she is very knowledgeable on the topic of social justice. So I decided that including her into this podcast would be beneficial not to just me to expand my knowledge on the idea of a uh, social class, but also it would be beneficial to listeners to hear uh, an outside opinion of somebody who is much more knowledgeable on the topic of uh, social class and the role that uh, higher education plays uh, with students of social class status. So before going into asking my mom questions about uh, social class, I had her describe what her previous roles were within uh, the University of Wisconsin River Falls. I was the director of a trio program. I helped undergraduate students who had federal definitions of being low income, disadvantaged, historically underrepresented students to um, get into PhD programs. So following this, I asked my mom what she thinks uh, the role social class has to a student who has experienced lower social class, uh, what role that status has going into higher education past high school. I think it's just always in the background for students who have that as their background. It's a thing that they can never completely leave because it has shaped their worldview and the things that students with a higher socioeconomic status have, um, they often take for granted. So everything is very intentional and there are a lot of social norms, things like that, that a lot of times Students trying to achieve a higher status with their education and having to use resources and all those kinds of things. They're trying. They're they're constantly having to um, think about these things. And a topic I knew I was not knowledgeable about was how uh, a student of lower class can easily transition into a new identity of privilege. They are now leaving the home where their parents may be of working class, of lower social class, and they are going to further their, educa uh, their education. They're going to provide themselves opportunities to really to elevate their social class status. So let me ask you this. If you are a student of a low social class and you're trying to conform to... Uh, the world where education people of privilege are educated, but then they have like family members who are of like lower class where they came from. How do they balance those two different lives? Well, I think they still want to have credibility with the people who've loved them and have been their family, but they're they're trying to bridge those two two worlds a lot of times. They're they're really becoming a different person. They're changing a lot with their education and and taking on um, these new ways of being and and being successful in that world. And so I think it can really be um, conflicting. Those things don't go together a lot of times. And uh, the rockiness of that that students experience, sometimes they... They can't take the pressure of it, and so they'll choose what they're comfortable with. And so a lot of times you'll have a student who seems to really be on a path, um, doing the things they need to do to achieve a certain level of education or uh, do certain things with that education. And in the end, a lot of times they don't quite make it because they have those things that are competing, and they, they just can't get over the hump there's an imposter syndrome for them that um, 
experience unless there's really good bridge programming. Um, they just can't make it sometimes. The programming that I was part of, they're tremendous resources. And these kids, they got pretty hefty stipends. And there was always a pull um, on that money. They were trying to pack up things that had nothing to do with the focus of the research or, um, you know, the real aim of the dollars, the purpose of the dollars were to alleviate uh, distraction uh, so they wouldn't have to work, so they could give their research and their studies their full attention. And oftentimes, they were really trying to take care of family members and problems that they had that are within the scope of or typical of persons experiencing that low economic status mm -hmm. that a lot of them are going to begin with. So there's this constant cycle of conversations always that that's what the money was for and that by continuing to try to patch up things that they could never fully patch up or take care of, it was keeping them in this cycle where they would never actually be in a position to to fix anything if they didn't um, put that aside for at least time so that they could pursue, you know, in a hearty way, the thing that would advance them. Right. And that's the sort of thing that students with a higher socioeconomic status and more resources and things that come naturally to them is that the state they've always been in, the state they know. Now let's take a complete 180. Let's turn to sports. My dad was very involved with sports. Um, he was my high school coach, and he has been coaching for over 10 years. He knows a lot about the system, and he has been dealing with parents and different types of families and families that come from all sorts of social class. So I decided that uh, picking his brain about how social class plays in the role of uh, students playing sports would be very interesting. How do you go about uh, dealing with the kids who cannot pay the sports activity fee to play hockey? Well, uh, at our school, uh, we have uh, scholarships available through either community education for our summer program, and then we also have scholarships available through the athletic office. And when I make announcements about registration, I make it very clear that uh, if any family needs financial assistance, that uh, where they could uh, go to uh, have that done. If I feel like a kid is, or a student athlete is embarrassed to do that, and that might be a hindrance for them to why they're not participating. Um, I'll, I won't say anything to the kid, but I'll maybe speak to the parents and then encourage the parent to sign up their child and then um, ask if there's anything that's holding them back. I won't mention money, but if money comes up, then I point them towards the appropriate resources to help them. Uh, what do you, how do you deal with the parents that might be too prideful or have you like not seen that be a problem before with parents just being too prideful and not admitting that uh, yeah. finances are hindering their child from playing? I think that uh, what you just said is a really good question. Because I think that uh, activities, be it athletics or, you know, theater or after school, things that involve finances, there's a lot of those families or those parents that actually encourage their kids to not do those activities because they're too embarrassed to deal with the, the money that's involved. And it's not just the money that's involved with the registration to play a sport. Right. Um, it's money that's involved just to participate, even if it's stupid things like meals after games or 
Pino Peril or any of those things. Correct. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I mean, um, you try to make them aware, aware that there's resources out there to help them. Or, um, we live in a community where no kid would ever be turned down to do an activity. All of these topics have brought a shed of light to the idea of social class and how it looks uh, in the real world. We have talked about students of low income status um, in college and what that experience is like for them coming into college and being of a lower class when they're with their families, but then they're making that transition to uh, a more educated status and all the types of resources that they have available for them while they uh, come into university. And we have also talked about sports and the ideas of um, what it's like to be a low-income status family and have to deal with sports fees and activity fees and how maybe sometimes like the stigma of scholarship or things getting paid for or maybe just being even simply too prideful to accept scholarship, uh, what that looks like in the real world practice. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast. My name is Paige Haley. Thank you for listening.